Welcome everyone to our webinar titled Mobility Aid Prescription for People with Dementia, facilitated by the Loop Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Hélène Gagné. I'm the director of the Fall Prevention Program at Parachute. Um, so Parachute is now the sponsor of uh, the Fall Prevention Community of Practice Loop and Loop Junior, along with the annual Fall Prevention Month campaign. This is the first webinar under Parachute. Before we begin, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, if you have questions about the technology, please type them into the chat box. My colleague, Marguerite Thomas, will be monitoring this. And if you have other technical issues like I just did, for instance, you can also email my colleague, Michael Jamar, and directly as a panelist, or you can send um, an email to him. He's gonna put his email address in the chat room as well. Um, and Michael will work with you to resolve any technical issues. If you have questions for our presenter, Susan, today about the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A box uh, that you find at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. They will be answered at the end of the webinar. You will only be able to view questions you have asked, not questions posed by other participants. And I want to indicate that uh, this webinar, along with many previous webinars, is uh, this webinar is rec being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about one week, along with the presentation slides. And you can also view previous webinar recordings uh, by simply heading over to the webinar page on Loop and click on Archive Webinars. So I would now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Susan Hunter. Dr. Hunter is an associate professor in the School of Physical Therapy at the University of Western Ontario. She practiced clinically as a physical therapist in the areas of orthopedics and geriatrics for 19 years, and then completed her PhD in epidemiology and biostatistics at the University of Western Ontario. For a complete bio of our presenter, please view the Zoom webinar invitation or check out loop. So without further ado, please take it away, Susan. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, so yes, my presentation is called Mobility Aid Prescription for People with Dementia. You know, I'm also having technical difficulties. There we go. So I want people to know who are attending that this is a third in a series of webinars. The first one was called Mobility Aids as Risk Factors for Falls and Dementia. And webinar number two <clears throat> was the assessment of safe four-wheeled mobility aid use for people with dementia, which was highlighting a new assessment scale um, that was developed in my lab called the Safe Use Mobility Aid Checklist or SUMAC. As Alain mentioned, um, these two webinars were presented through Loop so they are archived and can be viewed. For today's webinar, I'll be looking at mobility changes that happen for people with dementia, look at assessment of balance in gait in dementia, look at the effect of mobility aids on gait in, for people with dementia, and look at recommendations for training strategies. I will highlight some information that I presented from the first and second webinar so that um, there'll be a continuity if you did not um, attend the first two webinars. So the first thing that I wanna highlight are the mobility changes that happen with dementia. And definitely the cognitive changes are very prominent in that terms of what people understand happens with dementia. <clears throat> but changes in mobility actually happen very early in the disease process and are also progressive over time. So we have the cognitive changes, and that occurs across multiple domains for cognition, but is especially present in executive function. Sarcopenia, or loss of muscle strength, as well as muscle bulk, starts to present in about the middle stages of the disease. And this is independent of the level of physical activity that people engage in. People with dementia have difficulty multitasking, and this is an early presentation for symptoms. And why that happens is that mobility and cognition actually share the same neural networks so that your tasking systems have already begun to demonstrate changes. 
There are visual spatial changes that happen, particularly in the areas of depth perception and contrast sensitivity. So people have problems um, appreciating their environment in three dimension or appreciating distance um, between objects as well. There's decreased sensory processing. People will present with peritonia, which is involuntary resistance to path movement or pressure. So you may be assisting somebody to help them stand up from sitting and you go in to help give them a little bit of assistance to bring their trunk forward. They may involuntarily push backwards. And again, it's an involuntary um, action that happens. Apraxia, so the difficulty in motor planning, is present in about 32 to 35% of people with Alzheimer's disease. So that even when we demonstrate an activity, either verbally or visually for somebody, part of their inability to actually mimic what we've done or follow what we've done is due to apraxia. Radicinesia is also present. So it's a result of slowing, slowing of thought as well as processing of cognitive um, information. Plus there can be also extra parameter symptoms of rigidity. So similar sorts of things that you might see um, such as with Parkinson's where you have rigidity. And there are also changes in motor learning. So that in other patient groups, we know that error-based learning is more effective, um, but for people who have dementia, they do not respond well to error-based learning. They're not able to take advantage or have the insight to process errors. And I will touch in on some of the training um, approaches later in the presentation. So again, large changes in mobility, they tend to happen early in the disease course, and they progress over time. So specifically looking at balance changes in dementia, again, global impairment of balance happens for people with dementia, and this is related to um, changes that happen for sensory integration, so it's the ability of people to wait, visual, somatosensory and vestibular information, cognitive strategies, um, muscle function changes as well. And when we see these alterations show up in static, dynamic, limits the stability, anticipatory control and reactive control. So again, it's universal that we see changes in balance. And that when we look at the sensory inputs of vision, somatosensory and vestibular, so the information the brain uses comes in and helps it to process, um, we know that people with dementia have an increased reliance on vision for control of uh, balance. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, there are vision changes that happen with dementia. So that we have this um, shift in decreased weighting of sensory or vestibular information, but we also have visual spatial changes that lead to alterations in three-dimensional perception of people's environments. There's changes in the organization and integration of sensory information from vision, somatosensory, and vestibular systems. And we know that changes in executive function are what mediate the relationship between vision and impaired balance. Um, impairments are also seen in reaction times as they are slower, so they may be appropriate, but they just don't happen fast enough. There are impairments in motor output responses, which again are slower, they may be appropriate, but they don't engage fast enough. And that deterioration and balance function is greater in people with dementia than their cognitively healthy peers. So it's about 14% deterioration per year compared to about 4% that we see in healthy older adults. So this is um, looking at the, 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 the processing of sensory information. So this is a modified clinical test for sensory integration in balance. And there are four test conditions. You have a person standing on a rigid surface with their eyes open. Next one is a rigid surface and you ask them to close their eyes. So you remove the visual information to see then how well did they do with just proprioceptive and vestibular information. The next test situation is they stand on a disturbed surface or a compliant surface that distorts proprioceptive information and they have their eyes open. And then the fourth condition is the person stands on a compliant surface 
as well as having their eyes closed. So this last condition is challenging vestibular function. So again, you're looking at altering what information comes in and looking to see how well they can reweight and reorganize the information. So the upper four graphs are from a cognitively healthy adult. The bottom four graphs are from a person who was newly diagnosed with mild Alzheimer's disease. The graphs are on the same scale and that we can see even rigid surface, eyes open, people with dementia, sway more and we all sway. Um, it's just a normal part of our balance, but the degree of sway is much, much larger. And that as we remove or distort vision, somatosensory and leave vestibular, we expect that sway will increase because we've taken away some of the information our brain needs, but we can still ideally control our balance. But when we do that for people who have dementia, then the scale of disturbance is much, much greater. It's about a 12 fold increase actually in terms of the extent of sway that's seen in these individuals. And this is them just standing still. So dynamic balance, even just walking is a much more complex and more challenging activity from a balance standpoint. Gate changes that happen in dementia. We know that gate changes actually precede changes in cognition and predict conversion to dementia in people with mild cognitive impairment. And that the changes can be seen up to 20 years ahead of time. Um, changes in gait over time are greater in people with dementia than the cognitively healthy peers, same as what we saw for balance. Um, and the deterioration in gait occurs across all stages of disease severity. So it's not just a late presentation. Um, it happens prior to diagnosis, but we see a decrease in velocity, decrease in stride length. So they're starting to slow down, which it leads to an increase in double support time. Most important one to some extent is this increase in gait variability. And this is a marker of increased gait instability. And I'll talk about that a little bit more from some studies that I'll present. So this is again, just a presentation to show you the changes that occur between cognitively healthy and people who have mild Alzheimer's disease. So these first two graphs at the top here are from an older adult with normal cognition. We asked them just to walk at their normal comfortable speed. And first graph has them just walking without doing anything else. Second condition, we had them walking while counting backwards by sevens. And then we had the same task for the person with dementia. So even for their usual gait, um, you can see that the person with dementia was walking slower. And that it compares to 1.8 meters per second for the velocity for the cognitively healthy individual compared to 0.8 meters per second. The difference when we look at doing dual tasking um, for the cognitively healthy older adult, there's very, very little change. Um, they slowed down by one centimeter less than one centimeter. And when we look at the changes between just usual gait and dual tasking and the amount of extra load that's required for that person to execute those two tasks at the same time, we can see that their walking has slowed down considerably. Their path has also started to vary a lot more as well. And that this person went from 0.8 meters per second to 0.42. So their change from this normal condition without distractions to having a distraction of counting backwards by sevens, the change was about 42%. Anything less than 20% is considered normal. The person who we have here who is cognitively healthy, their change was less than 1%. So again, people with dementia have to work quite hard to do multiple tasks at the same time. And that if they're doing them while they're up and about moving around, there will be detrimental effects to their gait um, that we see that leads to instability. So indications for mobility, a prescription. So this is kind of just basic requirements for anybody. 
It doesn't apply just for people who have dementia. So that when we look at indication for mobility, for mobility aids is to enable independent ambulation. And we can have short-term use such that somebody is, has, isn't allowed to put full weight through lower extremity, say either because of an ankle fracture or a hip fracture or a hip replacement. But then there's also chronic long-term use, which is used to comp compensate for a relatively permanent impairment. And so that we know gait aids compensate for decreased balance, decreased strength, decreased coordination, they relieve pain during ambulation by offloading um, the lower extremities, and that they can deep, there's a decreased ability to weight bear on one of both extremities. So that the benefits for gait aid use is that it increases the base of support for an individual. So I'm dispersing the distribution of the weight over a wider surface. And it provides haptic clues, which is providing information through their touch that also helps to facilitate balance and mobility. Now, this is just an algorithm that I give to the physiotherapy students when I'm teaching them about mobility aids and how do we progress them. And again, it's no different for all people actually. So the first kind of status that we need to think about is what is their weight bearing status? If it's less than full weight bearing, which means they're weight bearing on one extremity um, fully, then we can look at standard walkers or two crutches. If the person is full weight bearing, we have a larger option. We have canes, crutches, and walkers, and the walkers can be standard, two wheel, and four wheel. Other clinical factors to factor into which one to choose is how much support you need, what are the physical demands of using that equipment, Accessibility, and that means how easy is it for a person to use that aid and be able to access their environment. So that a standard walker is low, whereas crutches are very high actually. Um, for any situation, stairs, which you can't do with a standard walker. Age limitations, I would say effectively there are none because age by in and of itself um, is not a good marker. Um, and cognitive demands. And this is relevant. This is where we get relevant for people who have um, dementia. In any situation where there's less than full weight bearing, crutches would not be the means to go because it requires high cognitive demands. It also requires high balance and coordination to be able to use. For somebody who has full weight bearing capacity, um, believe it or not, Canes require moderate levels of cognitive resources. There's a lot involved in terms of sequencing and coordination with the cane. Um, crutches, again, moderate to high. For walkers, four-wheel walker has the lowest, standard walker actually has the highest cognitive demands. Four-wheel walker is low, relatively speaking, because the person is able to maintain a normal-ish gait pattern. They just hold the walker and are able to move. Whereas the standard walk, if a person has to pick it up, set it down and walk too. And then they have to repeat that task. So there's a lot more that's involved in learning how to do the task. And then other factors that are taken into consideration, again, is it short versus long-term? Comorbidities, which goes into the physical demands, lifestyle, where is it going to be used? How, what's the person's strength like, their gait and balance? Because ideally, when we prescribe a mobility aid, we want to provide the least amount of support that's needed. We don't want to over-prescribe support. So there was part, I was part of a project that was, an, that was done in Australia through Monash University, Dr. Angel Lee, and it was looking at gait aid use in people with dementia. We particularly wanted to look at practice and factors that influenced practice. Um, and it was community care staff. So we knew that there were different practices amongst health professionals, whether you were a nurse, OT, PT, or non-professional staff. And we were looking to see, does that vary and how does it vary? And we did a surveys and we had 248 responses. I'm gonna focus on the responses we got from the 109 health professionals. So this was comparing practices for clients with and without dementia. 
So one of the questions we ask is, do you think people with dementia who are unsteady on their feet should use a gait aid? Overwhelmingly, 87% said yes. So just because somebody has dementia, I would concur as well. There is nothing absolutely to preclude um, people being given a mobility aid. We ask people, how do you assist your client with dementia when they appear unsteady on their feet and have a history of falling? And again, overwhelmingly, almost 91% said refer for physiotherapy for assessment and suitability for the type of gait aid. And the third question is, how do you assist your clients with dementia when they appear unsteady on their feet, have a gait aid, but do not use it routinely? Majority of people, almost 83%, said they would, again, refer to a physiotherapy. Biggest thing here was about person safety. That was an overwhelming feature that stood out between people who weren't, um, who didn't have dementia versus those that did was the issue about person safety. 70% of healthcare professionals, again, this is all healthcare professionals, said they would leave it within the person's reach and encourage them to walk with it. So there was some overlap that some of these people would have done this, that they would have the person assess for safety and other people would just tell them to use it. You've already had it, we'll use it. And I come to a point where um, there are definitely caveats to that statement. The other thing we looked at was what factors influenced the decision-making. So we asked them, do you consider feedback from family? Overall, 87% said yes. Um, feedback from the person with dementia was only at 65.7%. Um, I would say that's low. Um, Cause again, just because somebody has dementia does not mean they're unable to contribute and have autonomy in what care is delivered to them. Um, I'd like to consider use of a gate aid if assessed as a high falls risk, high response of yes, that if it improves the person's independence with walking overwhelmingly, 92%, will they consider if gate aid improves the person's walking quality, again, 92%, so this presumes that there's been an assessment. Will they will consider if the person performs well on a cognitive functional screen, so this is 63%, so again, High scores on a cognitive screen are not necessarily a driving factor to whether to prescribe um, a mobility aid. Um, they'll consider it if the person becomes independent with ADLs using one, again, overwhelmingly, and if they're independent with community activities using one, again, overwhelmingly. So there, from our survey here, that dementia in and of itself did not preclude the delivery of um, mobility aids. Again, the thing that seemed to distinguish between what the healthcare professionals did for people with and without dementia was the evaluation of safety amongst people who had dementia. Which brings me to this. So the Safe Use of Mobility Aid Checklist, or the SUMAP, was a scale that was developed in my lab specifically looking at how do we actually quantify safe use. So the assessment has nine tasks and each task is assessed on physical performance as well as safety. So do they put on their brakes? Do they stand within the base of support? Um, do they make contact with obstacles? So the assessment scale looks just at four wheel walkers. And that was done because that's what we got as feedback from healthcare professionals as the most common mobility aid that was prescribed for people who had dementia. So this assessment scale um, is within the public domain. I've given the website where um, if you go in, you can get access to the assessment form, which is in three languages, the user's manual, which is in English and French. And there's also an online training module that is done in English. So this is the only assessment skill right now that looks at safe use. And again, it's to help identify areas of concern, which then can be addressed in care plans, as well as potentially needs of interventions such as rehabilitation. So let's talk about falls risk and mobility aids. So balancing gait impairment. 
are probably the most pro after a previous false history are the most prominent risk factors for false. So we know that exercise can improve false risks, factors of gait balance and lower extremity weakness. And this is true even for people who have dementia. Um, yet there still may be deficits from having the person complete an exercise program, as well as this annual rate of decline for balance and gait exceeds that of what we see in older individuals, cognitively healthy older individuals. And therefore, mobility aids are prescribed to offset deficits. They're meant to provide support that gives appropriate amount of compensation. And that we know that mobility aids improve quality of gait in cognitively healthy older adults. But we have this contradictory finding within the literature that mobility aids are associated with a threefold increased risk for falls, actually increased odds of falling in people who have dementia. So I'm going to talk about what are potentially the underlying mechanisms for why does it increase falls in dementia to such a large extent. So possible explanations for this is that use of a mobility aid is a proxy for balance, leg strength, and gait problems. People are using the aid because they have problems in these areas. Well, we know that even if we account for the reasons that the gait aids are prescribed for individuals, mobility aid use still increases the risk of foot falls. This is very important. And this comes back to my point earlier, where just um, if someone comes in and they use, have been given an aid, um, majority of people who have mobility aids do not consult a healthcare professional. So that we may, though that person aid may not be appropriate, it may not be appropriately sized for them, and they may not have ever received instruction on how to use it. Be it a one-time thing or a training session or sessions. So this is really important and it's important to understand. We also know that there's unsafe maintenance of equipment. People who have these aids don't know that at least yearly, they should be checking the brakes, should be checking nuts and bolts to make sure everything is working fine. If someone should lose their balance, we know that the gate aid can interfere with pe people taking steps to the side. So it actually gets in their way of making an appropriate recovery maneuver. Um, it prevents the person from using their hands to effectively reach for support when there is gain loss of balance. It seems that all of us, regardless of whether we're young and healthy to being old and healthy or that whatever we're holding on to, we tend to continue to hold on to when we lose our balance rather than letting go and reach for another support service. Number six is an area that I've explored with my um, research is the increase in cognitive demands that are related to attentional processing and neuromotor control of how do you drive these things and how do I remember all the, the rules for use and how do I deal with extraneous um, distractions in the environment. Unsafe use of equipment is anecdotally reported, which I would say to a certain extent probably goes back to number two here that we know most people don't consult a healthcare professional. But again, we do know that cognitive skills will decline over time. So it may be a consequence of um, the dementia that the people begin to lose what they understanding what they should know. Um, healthcare professionals do not use methods that facilitate new learning in dementia. And that timing for first use of the mobility aid also might be important. If the mobility aid is a consequence of gait and balance changes that are a result of the underlying disease process of dementia, you're probably looking maybe middle um, stages of the disease where it might start, people might start needing compensation. And again, it might be at a point in time where the, um, the cognitive demands for that of learning a new task may be too much. Versus if someone has a history of osteoarthritis and they were using AIDS prior to the development of their dementia, then they may be fine and they may retain those skills for much longer. 
So looking at perceptions for mobility use, talked about what do the clinicians think, but what do people think? So this was a study um, that we wanted to identify the perception, perceptions of people with mild to moderate Alzheimer's and their caregivers on mobility aid use. So we interviewed 12 pairs of people. And from our interviews, five themes emerged. I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. Oh, I'll go back to the complete list. So there was acknowledgement of need, protecting sense of self, caregiver burden and oversight, health professional involvement, and environment and design of aids. And this one in particular was um, that things such as four-wheeled walkers weren't necessarily uh, able to be used in the home setting, there wasn't enough room, or that um, lifting and mobility aids in and out of cars was a problem as well. I'm gonna talk about a little bit more detail about the first four themes. So this acknowledgement of need, we found that both the caregivers as well as the people with dementia acknowledged that mo mobility aid was needed for balance and stability. And some of them acknowledged the needs but were not particularly happy about it, but still used it. So we had quotes such as, it helps me walk and it keeps my balance um, because she feels secure and that is what it's all about from a caregiver. And I don't like it, but it helps me with my balance. I feel quite safe walking around with it. So I think for, any person, there is a transition phase for going to using mobility aids. We know that all older adults, there can be a stigma that's associated with using mobility aids. There's a loss of independence. There's a loss of looking old. Um, so again, people can be quite insightful about their own um, view of things, but they can see a benefit for it. Second theme was protecting a sense of self. So this was maintaining dignity in the face of events and age and frailty, building a sense of confidence and security, and the walking aid is identity, a blessing or a cure. Um, that I'm a person with a walker, I'm not a person who is free. It makes me feel good because I don't like falling, especially on concrete. Concrete. It just helps me to get where I want to go. Caregiver oversight, this was important. So there was a need of vigilance for reminders, but it also relieved a certain level of burden. Um, he's had a couple of falls, so I'm just trying to make sure he's consistent in using it. For me, it makes me feel more comfortable. I do not know as far as he is concerned, but I feel he is a little safer with it. So we found that the caregivers had to do a lot of oversight about reminding the people to use it. Um, health professional advice, paradoxical beliefs and training for using it. You don't need no training. You find out and they just tell you how to use it. Um, reluctance to use in the home was one theme, but there are also challenges. Um, we found one individual, the caregiver related that the person had been in a rehab facility and that's where they learned. Um, but this is also a very common statement. She used a cane and then when our friend died, we borrowed a walker. So this transition of mobility aids or sharing of mobility aids is very common. And again, just because somebody presents with a mobility aid, it's good to actually inquire as to how long have you been using it? Who prescribed it? Where did you obtain it from? Did somebody size it for you? Did someone train you how to use it? Very important questions to ask. So effective mobility aids on gait in people with dementia. Um, so big thing is the increased cognitive demands and that use the mobility aid as a real life example of a complex motor activity. There's motor sequencing and coordination. The person has to navigate through an environment and they need to ne negotiate through obstacles. There are distractions in the environment which also increase cognitive demands. And people remembering what is, what is it that I have to do while I use the mobility aids also increases their cognitive demand. Our current understanding of cognition is that it is a finite resource. And that if we overtax that resource, then you will see a deterioration in function. And again, depending on where people get the mobility aid, that the timing of that may occur at a point in disease when um, available cognitive resources are limited. So contrary to intended benefits, people with dementia may experience instability, falls, and fractures while using mobility. 
So I'm going to present some results that I did in a study, and we looked at people with mild to moderate severity of Alzheimer's disease, and we looked at people newly learning to use a single point cane, newly learning to use a four wheeled walker, and then we also looked at people who are experienced using a four wheeled walker. And our testing protocol um, had people just walking. Um, for the people who were newly learning, we had them walk without the aid because none of them actually needed the aid. The goal was to actually see how much impact cognitively is there on just learning a new skill. So we had those people walk without their aid, gave them the aid after a training session, and then we reevaluated it. For and then we did dual tasking. So we asked people to count backwards by ones. And we looked at both their gait and their facility with the cognitive performance. And we looked at which one did they choose to prioritize when they did it together. And there are three configurations of walking that we gave them. So we had them walk in a straight path, which really doesn't happen very much in real life. There's what's called the Groningen meander walk test is where the person walks in this snaky path. And then there's a figure of eight test where they walk around two cones. So the first one I was looking at um, novel use of a cane. And what we found in for both cognitively healthy controls as well as our Alzheimer's, there was a decrease in gait velocity and an increase in variability. So again, that's that marker of gait instability. So both groups had this, but it was significantly greater in the people with Alzheimer's. When we then asked them to count backwards by ones, we found that there was a greater slowing of gait and a slowing of responses to their secondary cognitive task. And again, this was greater in the people with Alzheimer's. And we found that the people with Alzheimer's prioritized the cognitive task over the gait task when they were doing it. So they slowed down considerably, but they were able to provide more responses or responses in terms of, um, correct responses and number of responses to what they did when they were sitting in a chair. This is called a posture second strategy and it's associated with increased risks of falls because they've shifted their task away from their mobility. When we then looked at people learning to use four wheeled walkers, we had essentially the same pattern. This is looking at the change of velocity over the two um, gait tasks. Um, red were the cognitively healthy, the blue were the people with Alzheimer's, and that when we go from their usual walking, again, there was still a difference even from usual walking, but if we had them walking in a straight path, to then talking and walking in a straight path, to walking on the chronic and meander walk path, to figure of eight, to counting with a figure eight, we got this progressive decrease in gait velocity. And again, it was much greater in the people with Alzheimer's than the cognitively healthy. And in the simple walking condition of walking in a straight path where they had to count as well as walk with the mobility aid, the people with Alzheimer's, all of them used posture second strategy. When we got them into the figure of eight pattern, three quarters of the group actually switched prioritization and they prioritized the gate. That's a posture first strategy. So it shows that people with dementia have that ability to innately make the conversion. So they haven't lost the ability to reprioritize what is the most important for um, a challenging activity. Whereas just again, walking in a straight line, there, there's less sense of, oh, this is hard than walking in a figure of eight. And when we looked at people who were experienced with um, gait aids, we found that gait variability increased as we went from just a simple straightforward path to the figure of eight. And the difference between just walking with their walker and when we had them counting backwards by ones, again, huge increase in variability when we were looking at um, the figure of eight path. And you should know that um, gait variability measures in this less than three to 4% are considered normal. So even just walking in a straight line or the Groningen, 
their, their gait variability is in excess of what would be considered normal. We add a very simple distraction of counting backwards by ones, and we have variability that goes up to 14. So this is huge um, and challenging. After saying all of that, um, I wanted to determine, well, I really haven't said if uh, mobility days are actually a good thing. So in this test, we took people who were using a mobility aid and I tested them walking without their mobility aid. I again gave them their walker back and then I had them walk with their walker in their cognitive task. So this upper graph is their gait velocity. And we can see that with no aid, they're walking at about 0.7 meters per second. Their velocity increases when they were walking with their um, gait aid when we gave it back to them. But when we distracted them by counting backwards by ones, their walking slowed down and was statistically significant compared to walking without their aid. The important thing is gait variability. So that there is, you know, about for this group, they were, they were actually pretty good, about four um, for the variability measure. But when we gave them, that was without their aid, when we gave them their aid, their variability decreased. So that's a good thing. But when we then had them walking with their aid and counting backwards by one, their variability exceeded that without the aid. So we're seeing that any kind of distractions that challenge cognitive capacity can still, um, in some cases, even make it worse than what they were without their aid. So we need to be very careful about distractions in people's environment because it can adversely impact their walking when we can see that there are benefits in a non-distracting environment. So training strategies. So like I said, people's training and learning strategies change with dementia. And that what's recommended is implicit learning strategies versus explicit. So this is from a paper from Laura White. Um, and her quote is that impaired Im explicit memory, um, the conscious recollection of facts, ideas, or events, combined with a decreased capacity for explicit learning and error detection, limit the methods by which people with dementia can relearn mobility activities. So don't expect somebody with dementia to be able to self-correct if they get it wrong. Um, one of my clear remembrances um, when I was in clinical practice is working on inpatients with people who would have a walker and they would try to go through a doorway and they would catch the walker on the doorway and they wouldn't be able to get through, but they weren't able to correct it. They would just keep trying the same thing over and over again. So we need to know that people can't self-correct errors. Um, so that techniques of verbal instructions, corrective feedback, mental practice, discovery learning, all require explicit memory and ability to detect errors. And they are deemed not to be effective for people with dementia. So implicit memory remains relatively intact until late stages of dementia. And implicit memories are formed by recurrent practice of a task that does not require the learner to develop conscious rules that guide performance. So when short-term memory is compromised, considered implicit learning. So what does that mean? The best way to think about it is that it's errorless learning and it requires high repetition and low variability practice. And that the practice conditions are designed to prevent or minimize inaccurate performance during the learning process. So you're doing it over and over and over, over again with little variation, little chance of error in order to imprint in a sense that task. And that repetitive practice without error during practice may consolidate memory for correct performance within the implicit memory system. Plus, elimination or reduction of errors through errorless learning may also reduce frustration and increase participation of persons in who have dementia. We know that implicit learning practices have been successfully used to teach use of mobile phones, ADLs, such as independent eating, or to for refinding, and perform sequential ADLs. There is one case study 
um, that specifically looked at the training of mobility aid use in people with dementia using implicit learning strategies. So there's not a lot of literature that supports what a training paradigm should look like, but it's something to consider for how to approach the training with the use of a mobility aid. So some strategies is consider the setting, naturalistic settings in the person's home where they'll be using the equipment, familiar settings. Modify assessment and treatment to compensate for deficits. So um, again, people with dementia have deficits. So we need to modify what we do. We shouldn't treat them like they are cognitively normal. Therefore, we need to modify how we deliver, how we explain, how we interact with those people. Select tra training tasks that are functionally relevant and use objects that are familiar to the person. So again, that comes back to, it might be the person's specific learning environment might be very good. Whole versus part practice. Um, you can deconstruct a task and then chain or link activities together to get the whole task back. Um, limit the number of tasks within a training session so that the task can be completed multiple times. Practice session blocked in the same order for each session, again, to limit variation. But activities still need to provide a reasonable level of challenge for there to be a physiological change. So things such as balance, strength, endurance, and flexibility as an exercise program still need to be challenging. But if you're looking to teach somebody to use a mobility aid, you're really wanting to do that errorless approach, high repetitions, few um, number of different tasks, and you're going to be doing it over multiple sessions. This task protocol, again, is from the paper by Laura White. And this is for healthy older adults without cognitive impairment and their implicit learning strategy. Um, so it wasn't healthy older adults. They were people in um, long-term care settings. Um, and they may have had cognitive impairment was comprised of 12 visits in four weeks, and each visit was 60 minutes. So this gives you an idea as to what <coughs> is required or what is a reasonable um, intervention look like to say, we tried the implicit learning and this is what we found or we think we've done enough. But again, like I said, there aren't anything specific that's looked at mobility aid and isolation. So, Overall, people who have dementia should be provided access to mobility aids. They need to be assessed and trained. They need to ensure safety. We need to be able to quantify that safety. And we need to be able to monitor their function over time because we know that gait balance as well as the cognitive changes in dementia decrease over time so that there will be a natural deterioration in function as well. And we need to be able to evaluate if what we're doing or what aid the person is using is still meets their needs. So I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators um, and particularly dementia service, McCormick Dementia Services in London and the funding agencies who help support my research. Do people have questions? Great, thank you, Susan. Uh, so there are a few questions and I invite people to uh, put their questions in the Q&A box for Susan to answer. And I think the first question, Susan, was, uh, was posed when you were showing the slide about the uh, people walking and you know the difference between healthy and people with uh, cognitive impairment. And the question is, is there walking slower or is there a step shorter? You were talking about a difference in gait. Right, so usually when people start to walk slower, they are taking shorter strides and they're spending longer in double support. So those two kind of go together. Um, and th there's kind of an interesting thing because at least for our one study where we took people who were using mobility aids and we took away their aid, had them walk and then we gave them their aid back, their gait got better. Um, their, their gait velocity improved. There is debate as to whether walking faster is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and I have no judgment on that. 
it shows that there's been a change um, from something that was really slow to something that was a little bit better, but still not um, within what would be normal gate speeds. I hope that answers it. Yeah. Uh, so someone asked, why use one cane, which skews to one side rather than use two poles? So we were looking at it as, um, well, I would say based on what we saw with just one cane, two canes would be even more cognitively complex. Um, and if I'm thinking one cane, if we're looking at high prevalence that we see for osteoarthritis in an older population where there may just be one side that's more affected than the other. I personally wouldn't, so when we compare, when you look at the magnitude of impact for one cane and the four wheeled walker, cane has a greater, one cane has a greater cognitive load than the four wheeled walker, though both learning had um, a high cognitive load. Um, but people had a hard time just with one cane. So combining and coordinating use of two canes would be hard. Um, in that case, I would say don't go there. Um, and that it's probably better to go to something like a four wheeled walker where you don't have to worry about the coordination of right. activity Great. between two canes. The next question is, the, does the mobility assessment need to be done by a registered staff such as OT, PT, or RN? Ideally, I would say yes, because it's about us looking at assessing the entire person for their balance, gait, strength, um, placing that within a context of their um, what their living situation is, being able to contextualize that within their health status, taking in their feedback, as well as caregiver feedback. Um, I mean, people can obtain mobility aids. You know, you can just go to your like, shopper's drug mart if they have it, buy a cane, um, but you lose the insight that comes from someone who has specialized knowledge of what would be necessarily the best thing for that particular individual. Great. Next question is what cognitive assessment used to establish dementia diagnosis? Was there a range of score on the MOCA or MMSE that was used to meet criteria in the study? Yes, so we did use the MMSE because that is kind of a standard measure that's used in research to denote mild, moderate and severe. Um, I do believe we use scores greater than 13, but less than 24. Okay. Have you heard of any research on the benefits, if any, of Nordic polls for people with dementia who have gait problems? No, um, that has not been looked at. Um, again, that comes down to something with the previous question, either two canes or two poles. Um, and I think it would come down to a question of timing with a person's um, degree of cognitive impairment or stage of disease severity. Um, the, the whole issue of cognitive burden and cognitive load is really important to consider and that we need to see this more than just a musculoskeletal issue and that what might work fine for someone who's cognitively healthy, you're superimposing a added burden for um, people who have dementia because of the cognitive processing and that doing multiple tasks becomes problematic. Um, and in the, my earlier um, pictures where I was showing you the changes in gait and balance that happen between um, cognitively healthy, they were people newly diagnosed with um, mild Alzheimer's. So you're looking at scores between 20 and 24. So these are very high functioning individuals, but they can be quite compromised by altering sensory information that comes in or distracting them. So 
it's beyond just an MSK problem that needs to be considered. You also need to look at how much does their gate change, um, as well as where do they prioritize multiple tasks, because you do need to put them into these dual task challenges to actually see how well they are, their, their cognitive function can cope with doing more complex tasks. Um, the next question is gate assessment part of routine dementia diagnosis monitoring at this time? Not, no, I would say no at this time. I know the um, geriatric service at Parkwood Institute here in London, um, they do do dual task gate testing for people who come through their memory clinic. And it's a means of helping to look at um, by giving a brain challenge, how frail or fragile is the person's um, function. Um, and particularly for people who have mild cognitive impairment, um, deterioration in gait performance under dual task testing is associated with conversion to dementia. Um, I think when we look at function and mobility, most of the things that we do in our daily life are in distracting environments or require us to do multiple tasks, either multiple motor tasks or motor and cognitive tasks. So I think we need to consider the incorporation of either complex activities if, a if you don't think a person could do, say, counting backwards by ones or sevens, then rather than having them walk in a straight line, you do have them walk in a figure of eight. So you need to actually challenge their ability or you give them a couple of tasks, have them walk in a straight line, and then you have them do a figure of eight to see how, how stable is that performance across different challenging challenges. Because then again, um, our motor tasks are very complex. Our living environments are very complex. Walking in a straight line in a very um, controlled, safe environment is not necessarily going to help us understand what people do in their real world. And we need to challenge them to show that. So maybe one, le uh, one more question. We have many questions and I wanna point out, keep on sending them because what will happen after the webinar Dr. Hunter will work on those questions, I hope, and we can provide a document um, in loop uh, along with the slides and the, the, the recording that will answer your question. So maybe the last one, did you look specifically at the use of brakes on four wheel um, walkers uh, with those with dementia, even though the study showed less cognitive burden with those walkers compared to other devices? Brake use is always a challenge with those with dementia affecting prescription. Right, so there was, um, yes, so that was coming back to the, the safe use of mobility aid checklist. In our um, validation and just use of it, we actually looked at what were the issues on safety. So rather than physical performance is actually the person's interaction with their equipment and lack of using the brakes um, was very high. Um, I think it was about 90% of people didn't put on brakes. Um, yeah, so that's very, very common. Which again, um, I think the, we need to consider that the majority of people don't see a healthcare professional. So they don't learn. And they also don't see that there's a need to learn anything special about using this, these kinds of equipment like walkers. So anybody that comes to us already with the need, we need to find out who prescribed it, where did you get it? Did someone size it? Did someone train you and how to use it? And you know, apart from actually administering that SUMAC um, is actually having people can you demonstrate for me how you would get from sitting in a chair to stand up, walk across the room, turn around and come back? Almost like doing a, a tug, but a little bit longer um, to actually see what they do. That's a minimum. But um, yeah, if the majority of people haven't seen it and the majority of the people don't know what they're supposed to be doing with the equipment. 
Great. Thank you, Susan. As always, it's always a, a very informative uh, presentation. And I want to remind everybody that Susan, this is her third presentation on this topic and that the other, the first two are available on loop uh, under archive webinars. So thank you again, Susan, and thank you for all the part uh, participants to join us today in this great discussion. So the questions we hope will be answered later and posted later. So for more information about the Fall Prevention Community of Practice, please visit loop at fallsloop.com. And when the webinar has ended, you'll be redirected to Zoom and invited to participate in a short evaluation survey. Click the blue button uh, that says continue on your browser and you'll be redirected to the survey. We would appreciate your feedback as this is important for us for future webinars. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.